assisted educators. We all touch the world in our own unique way. So if I ask you the question, how is your creativity causing an evolutionary cultural transformation, what do you say? Keep this question in mind until you hear a creative idea that inspires the way you think and the way you feel. If you ask me the question, well, one of the creative things that I'm doing at the moment is a PhD in the subject of creativity. What this means is that I have to produce an original piece of work and explain it in around 80,000 words to persuade the experts in my field of expertise that I'm making a valuable contribution to the world of education. The two key concepts are originality and value. These two concepts form the basis of academically accepted definitions of creativity. I used my research over the past few years to synthesize my concept of creativity, which I see to be like a lotus flower with many petals. And on the handout that you have in front of you, I have illustrated that as the seven P's of creativity. Today, I will highlight three key messages around creativity. First of all, that creativity doesn't occur in a vacuum. Creativity occurs in the context of society, culture, and history. Secondly, the creative person is only one aspect of creativity, and it's the interaction of various other factors, for example, persuasion and place, that contribute to creativity that stands the test of time. Thirdly, there are at least four stages in the process of creativity, and each of these stages can take minutes, days, years, and sometimes even decades to accomplish. I used my research findings to create a mastermind exercise. And for this illustration, I've used a photo taken by Berenika in Poland at the conference last year. And the concept of the maypole with ribbons of light is based on the psychotherapy work of Phyllis Crystal. The concept of the mastermind is based on the work of Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich. In this exercise, we imagine ourselves connected with each other through a matrix of light and connected with a higher source of creativity through these arrays of colorful light. Later on this evening, we will have the opportunity to practice this exercise with Carmen and myself and with Gerard and Karen's forces. Now, when we, Carmen and I, developed and practiced this exercise in Andalusia in July this year, we managed to gain the attention of this large herd of mares from a distance within seconds. Within minutes, we had bonded with these horses. Even though this was the first time that I had met these horses, I felt a very deep connection and feelings of bliss. It was as though the creative visualization enabled us to create a very playful, creative encounter. Now, there are several assumptions I made underpinning the success of this exercise, and I invite you to play along with these assumptions. The first assumption is that we're all connected to each other through our energy. And the assumption is that there is a higher source of creativity that we can access. The second assumption is that we access creativity where the conscious mind meets the unconscious mind. And this is facilitated through a state of being in deep relaxation when we are in silence and stillness. The third assumption is that we access creativity by stimulating the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain simultaneously. 
In this exercise, we stimulated the right side of the brain by visualizing the colorful rhythms of light and imagining the shapes, the triangular shapes connecting us with the higher source of creativity and to each other. And we stimulated the left side of the brain by reflecting on our question, how is my creativity causing an evolutionary cultural transformation? I have to emphasize this is only one stage in the creativity process. This was preceded by at least two stages and followed by one more. And I will explain those other stages when I'm talking about the creativity process. Now, creativity doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs in the context of society, culture, and history. And we all make assumptions about creativity based on our environmental context. For example, this question assumes that we are all creative. Hands up if you believe that we're all creative to a certain extent. Well, we believe this now, but this is a relatively modern belief. Because until 1870, the word creativity didn't exist. And it wasn't until the 1950s that the word creativity as a concept began to be used widely. The ancient Greeks believed that only the gods and the goddesses could be creative. The assumption in those days was that mere mortals like you and I could only imitate or uncover what already existed in the natural world. It wasn't until the 14th century, the age of the Renaissance, and the age of the Enlightenment from 1650 to the 1800s, that the absolute authority of religion and spirituality began to be questioned. We think of Renaissance artists, for example, Michelangelo, who sculpted David, as being very creative. But David claimed that he saw, sorry, Michelangelo claimed that he saw David trapped in the marvel and that all he did was chisel away around him to set him free. Similarly, Mozart claimed that he heard entire compositions of music in his mind, and all he did was just write it down as though he was taking down dictation. In other words, they echoed the ancient Greek belief that we cannot create anything new, we merely uncover what already exists. In the 19th century, Darwin's theories of evolution helped to explain the process of natural selection and our need to adapt in our struggle for survival. These theories helped to further humanize creativity. We could argue that each one of us is creative because we've remained alive, we've successfully remained alive by overcoming all sorts of threats and challenges to our existence. As we've evolved, we've matured, we've adapted, and sometimes we've radically transformed our lives. That, in itself, is a creative process. However, the Western beliefs about creativity are very different to the Eastern beliefs about <coughs> creativity. In the West, creativity seemed to be a linear evolutionary process with a beginning and an end. God created the world in seven days. And on each day, there was something original that added value. In the East, the perspective on creativity is different in two respects. First of all, creativity is seen to be a cyclical process. And instead of originality, the focus is more on adaptation and transformation. Instead of challenging the status quo with non-conformist ways that disturb harmony, <coughs> Eastern creativity seeks to gracefully transform and adapt to the environment rather than forcing the environment to adapt to us. What I love about the Eastern approach is that 
when we think we're going forwards, we're in fact going backwards. For example, it seems very progressive to allow horses to roam around freely. But there was a time in the past when that was perfectly normal. And I believe that there will be a time in the future when it will again be perfectly normal to allow horses to roam around freely. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So bearing in mind this contextual diversity in terms of how we perceive creativity and the assumptions that we make about creativity, let's look at the creative person. Now, each of these men is recognized as causing an evolutionary cultural transformation and it's difficult to imagine how the world would be without their contribution. Even though historically our cultures and our societies have empowered more men than women to be creative, I'm sure that regardless of gender, we can all identify with these men in various ways. For example, they were all deeply passionate about their work. Their creativity was inspired from within. They were internally motivated. They were highly self-motivated and they were not interested in external rewards, for example, fame or favors or financial gain. They all spent a lot of time either thinking about their work or working and perhaps as a result of this, perhaps as a consequence, they all had unhappy, unfulfilled family relationships. Indeed, psychoanalysts argue that one of the most powerful driving forces for creative expression is this desire for us to fill that inner emptiness, that inner void, our desire to resolve those trials and tribulations arising from unresolved, intimate relationships. Now, I won't ask you to admit this in public, but I'm sure that there's more than one person in this room who's been accused of loving their work or loving their horses more than they love their families. <laughs> well, I have some good news for you. You're in good company because research shows that highly creative people need solitude. They need to spend a lot of time alone because they're most productive when they're alone. They, they have their best ideas when they're on their own. And in fact, group activities, for example, brainstorming in groups to generate creativity, have proven to be a bit of a myth because highly creative people are often inhibited in groups. However, we mustn't confuse solitude with isolation. Too much solitude leading to isolation, we fall into the trap like Van Gogh did. Van Gogh is the odd man out here because he was not recognized for his creativity during his lifetime. Although he was creative, he lacked the skills of persuasion and therefore he died penniless and unrecognized. On the other hand, Gandhi was not the most creative freedom fighter. There were other freedom fighters that were far more creative than Gandhi was. However, he had excellent persuasion skills. And therefore, he still is recognized and associated with India's struggle for independence, whereas others have long been forgotten. So, persuasion is a fundamental aspect of creativity. We cannot claim creativity unless we can persuade the experts, the gatekeepers in our industry about the value and the impact of our work. Obviously, winning some training awards, HR training awards, prestigious awards like that helps. So, for example, when Olga won the award in Russia, we all heard about it. And then when Gerard commented that that was one of the best achievements in horse-assisted education, it validated the claim. That is all part and parcel of the persuasion element of creativity, which is fundamental. But here there seems to be a bit of a paradox, because highly creative people, we spend a lot of time on our own. We're not motivated by external rewards for fame and fortune, we're rewarded by inner things. So, 
how can we be persuasive in society? I will explain that apparent paradox a bit later when I'm talking about the different stages in the process of creativity. But in order to be persuasive, we need to be in the right place. So where are you most creative? Which country? Which city? What type of home? Sometimes the place where we're most creative is not the place where we were born. It's not the place that we claim belongs to us. Sometimes the place that we're most creative is the place that we belong to. It's that place that has called us, that place that has pulled us, that has tugged us away from our comfort zone. But place is not just about physical location. It's also about positioning. For example, imagine Van Gogh as a politician. Imagine Gandhi as an artist or Shakespeare as a scientist. We all make, we all touch the world in our own unique way, but sometimes you will notice people trying to claim that they're an expert in this field and that field and that field over there. And this lack of authenticity is a bit like a straw man without a true soul. And I believe that creativity arises from deep love and passion, which is generated by the soul. In the same way that we need to create boundaries around our families to create more trust, to have a deep level of trust, we need boundaries in the same way we need boundaries around our creativity in order to deepen our understanding, in order to gain that level of high level of mastery to be truly convincing. So now for the process of creativity. About a hundred years ago, in 1926, Graham Wallace wrote a book called The Art of Thought. He described his case studies of famous people known to be creative, and based on these findings, he proposed a four-stage model of creativity. The first stage is the stage of preparation. This is where we gain knowledge, experience, and expertise. And research shows that on average, this can take around 10 years. Now, going back to the exercise that Carmen and I did with the horses in Andalusia, I said that that was only one stage in the creativity process. Both Carmen and I have been around horses for over a decade. So we were both fully mentally and intellectually prepared to be around horses. We knew how to behave in order to gain the trust of horses, regardless of what exercise we did with them. The second stage in the creativity process is the stage of incubation. Now this is where our project seems to, nothing seems to be happening on the conscious level. The project seems to have gone underground to the subconscious level. And we all have hundreds of unresolved, unfinished projects lying dormant in our subconscious. When we work with the horses, sometimes it's difficult to predict which of these unfinished projects is going to be triggered for a response. The third stage is the stage of illumination. Now this is familiar to many of us because this is when ideas just seem to pop up from nowhere, either because we're around horses and we're present, or but this always happens in a state of deep relaxation. Either we're lying on the beach somewhere, we're very relaxed, but this is where the project or the issue has been properly prepared for and uh, the, the right amount of incubation has taken place and then the ideas just arise. Now the last stage is critical. The stage of verification is critical because we all have thousands of ideas not all our ideas are useful, valuable or appropriate. And this is the stage where we need to come out of the solitude of our caves and we need to get feedback from our peers and we need validation from the gatekeepers, the experts in our field of expertise, to sort out the wheat from the chaff. We need to be promoting our best ideas and not just any ideas. So, to summarise, creativity occurs in a context of society, culture and history. 
And the creative person is only one aspect of creativity. And it's the interaction of persuasion, place, and various other factors that contribute to creativity that will stand the test of time. And thirdly, there are at least four stages in the process of creativity. Preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. Now, the, um, in some Japanese companies, they have business plans extending for 100 years. So let's imagine it's the year 2115, 100 years from now. Imagine that in the year 2115, 100 years from now, somebody's doing a presentation talking about the evolution that's occurred in the equine-assisted education industry over the 100 years from now till then. Now, in that presentation, whose faces will they be using to illustrate their points about the evolution that's taken place? Will it be all men? Will it be all women? Will it be a balance of gender and race and geographical locations? Above all, will your face be there? So, when I ask you, how is your creativity causing an evolutionary cultural transformation, what would you like to say? Thank you.